Hi, my name is Jessica Baxis, and I'm a project coordinator and system designer for Enterprise Systems Group. Today, I will be walking you through a training video on the Mitel AWV, Audio, Web, and Video Conferencing Unit. First, we're going to start by how to log in. Be sure to get the address from your system administrator of what to browse to when you open up your browsing window. Once you've put in that address bar, you will get your login information on your screen. First, you will need to sign in with your login ID. I'm just going to be using my credentials for the training purpose. And then I'm going to be entering in my password. Again, for this information, if you are unsure, please refer to your system administrator. Once I put in my login ID and password, I'm going to hit enter to log in to my AWV client. Once I have logged in, you will notice here that we are brought to the home screen. This screen is laid out with setting options down the left, as well as tabs across the front, and always you are logged into your home tab to start. You are able to change this setting if you would wish to log into your new point mailbox settings by a default setting under settings menu on the left. If upon original login you are not brought to your home screen on the AWV, you can click on settings on the left hand menu. And under settings, there's a preferences section right here. This says the default page that you would like to log into. Be sure to select the audio web video conferencing. So next login, you'll be able to be um, brought to that home screen. If you do make changes here, you can simply click save for those to save. So let's go back now to the home screen of our audio web and video conferencing. Our home tab here gives us a brief summary and different options that we can use to be able to manage our AWV account. You'll see along the top here, it starts with an instant conference. This allows you to be able to start a conference on the fly without having one already pre-scheduled. And you can select the set conference type using the dropdown. By default, it's set to audio and web, but you can change that. Perhaps you're already on the phone with a, a user or um, a team member, so you might just maybe want to launch the web only. Or perhaps, again, just the audio bridge. So you can choose the default settings there. The system will pre-populate your extension number for the system to be able to generate that call and join you into the conference. And you can also add a participant phone number right from here. So again, without having to send conference bridge information to someone, you can just auto start this conference right here from the instant conference. Once this information is populated, the start conference button allows you to be able to launch that conference from based off of your settings. Below our instant conference, we have some menu options here. Setup conference gives us a couple different um, button items to be able to select. There's a one-time conference, a reoccurring conference, a reservationless conference, and then see my conferences. How again this page is laid out is all of the options that we have tabs for across the top, we also do see on our home screen, so we can access that very easily right from here. We'll be diving into conference setup in a little bit, but I'm just gonna finish the layout of the home screen page first. We also have some different other features and menu options that are provided here in this middle section. We can access our recorded conferences. We can analyze our usage reports on your user ID. We can have access to our account settings where we can change and personalize some um, settings for our account, as well as we can verify our client. Again, we'll be talking about some of these other features a little later on in the training video. And then finally, towards the bottom of our home screen here, we have available conferences. Again, the system pre-populates your extension number for you and then lets you know any available conferences that you have out there to be able to join. You can see here that I have two conferences that are listed under my available conferences and any other conference that I have scheduled within a 15 minute time frame of that start of conference would also appear under here. So in the next section, I'm going to be walking you through these different menu tabs across our um, home screen here and dive into the features and functions of the AWV. All right, let's talk about how to set up a conference. The second tab from our home screen is what we'll want to click on to be able to get our different options of what type of conference we want to schedule. The first option is we have a one-time conference. Let's talk about this. 
What a one-time conference means is it's going to occur on one day at one specific time, and we don't need to access that conference after that. The conference details will allow us to be able to schedule this one-time conference. So let's go through the different fields that you'll want to fill in to schedule your one-time conference. First, the conference owner, this should say your name. We'll talk about being a delegate a little later on in this training. So if you are a delegate for other people's conferences, you would have a drop down with additional names here to schedule someone else as the conference owner. But I'll keep my name here for the training. The conference type, again by default, it selects audio and web, but using this drop down menu, you are able to schedule as well as an audio only or a web only. The conference name. You can put in any name here, perhaps sales meeting, operations update call, or maybe a specific project that you're working on. I'm just going to put in test for the training purpose. Our start date and time. Here again is a drop down for the months and the days and the year, or we can use the pre-built calendar to open up an option for us to select the day that we would like to choose this conference to occur on. So I'm going to schedule my conference for this Friday. So I can pick the third it'll populate the information then across those fields. The start time. Again, these are drop down sections for me to pick the hour, the minute, as well as AM or PM, and then this, um, the time zone that I'm in. I want this meeting, let's say nine o'clock AM on Friday. I'm in central time, so I'm gonna keep that the way that is. The duration, again, hours and minutes. What I like to tell people in my training is that your conference will be available for you to access 15 minutes prior to the start time. As well as the duration that you put in, your conference will last that long. What is nice about the system is that it will give you a warning alert when your conference is nearing that end of the duration. So if I selected that my conference was gonna last one hour, when I'm getting to about 55 um, minutes, the conference will let me know that my conference is about to expire and give me the option if I would like to extend it. The conference will never just automatically shut you off, which is a nice feature. And then finally, you have here um, whether or not you would like to show this conference in the published area. This is a checkbox. The published area is accessible by giving the address for someone to browse to on the internet. And on that original login screen that I showed you all before, there's a link there that says access the public portal. If you are to publish a conference, a user can just browse to that address that you give them and see that conference available in the public portal for them to access without having you be able to send them an invite or the proper um, login email credentials. What I always like to stress in my training is that if you do decide to publish a conference, you always want to make sure you password protect it. And I'll show you that's an option towards the bottom of these um, credentials that we're setting up for that conference. That means that not anyone can just join a conference if it's published. You as the owner would still have to give them the login credentials and that password for them to be able to log in. The next section down is billing codes. This would have to be set up by your system administrator. If they wanted to utilize department and project codes, they would be able to run reports on the system based off of those codes. And then you as an end user would get a drop down field here with the available department or project codes that are built in the system for you to select for this particular meeting. The call features. This is an important section because it allows you as the conference owner to be able to have some features based off of your participants as well as you, the owner of the conference. The first checkbox says leader required. If I decide to check that, the leader must be in the conference for it to start. So as people are dialing into my conference bridge, they will have the option to hear music on hold or turn it off until me, the leader, dials in and activates the conference. If I leave this unchecked, anyone calling in with my conference credentials would be live and active on the conference bridge and be able to talk to one another before I got and activated the conference. So that's a personal preference and up to you. I generally like to have this checked because I like to be in my conference and have everyone start at the same time. Join muted. Participants enter this conference muted. This is a good feature to use if you're doing a large training seminar perhaps where you can have this selected, where you don't have to worry about individuals being required to mute themselves, you can just mute everybody that joins the conference. 
For my typical update calls that I host, I, I, I don't check this, but again, this is more of a feature that you could use for larger trainings. Roll call. This is a nice feature that allows you, if you check this box, that the system requires and asks a participant to say their name before joining the conference. And then you, again, as the conference owner, have the option to play that name to all the participants that are on the call or only to you as the leader. So I usually have it play to the leader, so I'm able to take notes on who's joining my call and be able to call them by name once they've joined. Then we have a couple more um, options here, join and leave tone. Again, as people are calling into my conference bridge or if they drop off, I have the option to play a beep. And again, as the leader, I can play that to all participants or just me as the leader only. Sometimes I like to have it just play to me so it doesn't become bothersome if people are joining and leaving mid-conference and it could possibly potentially interrupt callers that are already talking at that point. But if it's just playing to me, none of the other participants would hear that, but I would know that someone's joined, um, joined my conference or left. Personal ID. The system does allow you to associate a personal ID to your account. And you, as the owner of the conference, um, are able to check these boxes again to require someone to enter a personal ID at the um, start of the conference um, or that your conference um, access requires approval. So someone that wanted to join your conference, you as the conference leader would have to approve that before they would be able to call into your conference. And then the duplicate personal IDs, if you are using a personal ID um, for that you're requiring for your conference, you would allow a user to have a duplicate to be able to um, call in. If you uncheck this, that would require each individual to have a unique ID to join. I personally don't use um, um, personal IDs for my um, end users that are joining my call, so I usually leave these unchecked. Um, I will show you, though, in the next type of conference that I go through, what you as an end user um, can set up for reservation list conferences and how a personal ID could help you there. And then finally, here's that password protection section that I talked about a little earlier. This section, if you are going to publish your conference, you're going to want to make sure that you password protect it. Right here, we're going to be putting in our password. It gives you a little bit of instruction on the type and security of password that you should use. And then on the bottom, you're going to want to enter that in a second time to confirm it. You have the option to email this password in the invitation if you're going to do that. Again, I like to tell my trainees that I only password protect if I'm going to publish that conference. I don't password protect on conferences that I'm just going to send out invites for because that already requires access information that I'm including in that email anyway. Once you've set up your conference on the top or the bottom of the conference, you have the option to clear, cancel, or I'm going to hit OK to save this conference setup. Once I've hit OK, it actually takes me then to the conference details of this conference that I've just created. What's great about this is it gives me a nice summary here based off of green check marks or red X's of what I have included or did not include in my conference that I have created, as well as it gives me the access information in this gray box off to the side of the information for this particular conference. It gives me my dial-in numbers, my access code is the leader or the participant. And then what's really nice is right from here, I can invite my participants. Whether or not I want to launch my calendar integration, where it would take me to my email server, whether you're using Outlook or Google, and allow me to be able to email that calendar invite or send out the calendar invite, or I can strictly just open up my email to send out that invite. So the next section we're going to be talking about is how to schedule a reservation list conference. A reservation list conference allows you to be able to have an outstanding conference that's always available for you to join whenever you need to. I'm not going to be going through all of the sections again because what's nice is no matter what type of conference we're creating, whether it be a one-time, a reservation list, or next we'll talk about a reoccurring, all of the fields are the same with a couple of um, slight differences and we'll talk about those now. So a reservation list conference allows me to have a start date and an end date. And you can see here that I can have a couple years for my conference to last that will always be out there for me to join with the same credentials each and every time. 
So again, I'm going to go through all of the conference details of naming it, the type of conference. My start and end date here, again, gives me till the end of 2020, if I set it up today, that it would be available for me to use. If I want to publish this reservation list conference, I can check this box here. Again, I'll always want to make sure I password protect on the bottom that we went over in the earlier episode. And then the, one of the main differences here is the access codes. So what's nice is having this reservation list conference, instead of getting that longer digit access code for the participant as well as the leader, you are able to select your own access codes on a reservation list conference. So that's definitely a perk. I, as a leader, can choose an access code here that's familiar to me that I'll always remember. So I don't need to reference an invite or log into my AWV to get those credentials. I'll just always remember them. And then same for my participants. I can pick a code that's easy enough for them to be able to dial in that doesn't require a long random digit code that gets generated if I were to perhaps schedule that one-time conference as you saw earlier. So anytime um, I'm doing a reservation list, I have this option by selecting access codes. I could put in here any digit of number that I wanted to, uh, whether I want it to be you know, something easy like that for me and maybe my participants, I would put in my extension. Um, again, something that's easy for them to dial in with. All the other fields are the same. So we'd go down our list here, filling in all of the different ac um, areas for creating my reservation list conference. And once I was ready to um, save this, all I need to do is hit OK. So the final type of conference that we're going to talk about is the reoccurring conference. Again, it's going to bring me to my conference details of all of the information that I'm going to fill out. And the only difference here compared to the other two we already discussed is a reoccurring allows me to select the reoccurrence type, okay? If I want that to be daily, weekly, or monthly, I'll select one of these bullets, as well as I can pick the days of the week or every day. So let's say I want to do a weekly reoccurring call, all right? Maybe I have a particular project that we have weekly update meetings for, all right? I can select which day I want that to reoccur on, all right? So how about every Monday? We have our ops call, all right? As well as, again, up top here, what time do I want to start this on? And my start date, okay? I always have the option to show it published if I want. Remember to password protect if you do that on your portal. But this is the only difference for the reoccurring type conference. Anytime I create a conference, whether it be that one time, reoccurring, or reservation list, anytime I hit save, it'll always bring me back to my conference details. But let's talk about the conference details ne tab next. My conferences shows me all of my available conferences that I have scheduled, okay? So it'll show you um, the type of conference. So here I have a one-time conference. This was the test conference that I set up earlier. It lets me know a few details and I can, again, invite users from here, change the details or delete if I needed to. My reservation list, and again, if I'm a delegate, I will also see those delegated conferences down below of ones that I've scheduled for somebody else, and then we'll talk about that in a little while. What's nice here, though, is let's say you need to reschedule your conference, okay? That time slot didn't work anymore. This is the place you want to come to. Under my conferences, you see the conference that you have scheduled out there, and you're going to hit change, okay? This allows you and opens up those conference details again where I can change the date and the time if I need to, or even the duration before that conference is active. Also from the one-time conference is I can see my expired conferences, okay? So this is also a good one. If I've already gone out there and set up a conference for a meeting that I needed to have, and maybe it expired, and that meeting now is gonna take place at a different time, and I didn't come in here to change it in time, instead of having to recreate that, I can just come here to see my expired conferences, and it's gonna bring me up a whole list of conferences that have already expired for me, and I can reactivate those just by changing those credentials from this list. Let's talk about recordings next. Recordings allows you from audio or audio and web conferences to be able to record those. If you have any recordings, you'll see them appear here and it says you have no audio recordings at this time. Otherwise, I'd see a list of ones that I could access. 
as well as I have a link to see my web conferencing recording. So any of those audio and web conferences I created, I would be able to access those recordings from here as well. When we get to the web client, I'll show you how you can actually record. Let's just finish up with some settings. Under our settings menu here, this is where we have the ability to change our password for our login credentials. We're able to associate another phone number, perhaps maybe a cell phone if we wanted the system to know about that they could call out to to join me into a conference. We can select our invitation preference here. So once I've set up a conference and I click either that calendar or email, when I click that I want to email the conference details to somebody, this is where I can specify that invitation format. Whether I'm using the default or a Google calendar, as well as if I want a long or a short calendar greeting or customized greeting. In this box below, you'll be able to also type a customized greeting if you wanted to and preview that before you were to save. Any invite then that you send out will use this format that you set up. Below the invitations, you've heard me use the word delegate a few times. This is where you can assign a delegate. What that allows you to do is be able to assign a user that can schedule conferences for you. So if I were having a, an assistant handle my calendar and setting up my meetings for me or conferences, I could put in their email address right here and click add. That user then would get an invitation and be able to, when they're logging into their own client, as I showed you earlier, get a drop down for conference owner. If they're a delegate, then they'd be able to use that drop down and select my name as the conference owner when they're scheduling those conferences. And this is where you can set that delegate up. And then finally, personal ID. This is where you can manage your personal ID. A lot of times you'll see just your extension be your personal ID, but if you were to choose a different number, this is where you could assign that. And then finally, the last menu across the top is reports. This allows you to report on your personal user information and your AWV usage. You're able to select a date range from the dropdown, as well as, again, if your system administrator set up department or project codes, you would also be able to pull information by sorting by those. And then the format or sort by conference date. Conference name, again, department or project if you are utilizing those codes. By hitting OK then, you would see a list of your conferences that you had. If you didn't have any, it would just say no results found, or it would give you and generate a nice report here where you could see the date, the time, the participants that were in your conference, all sorts of really helpful information. That's all we have for our main menu settings. The next section we're going to be talking about how to handle your audio calls in your conference bridge as well as the audio and web conference portal. When I have a, an available conference to join, if I'm on the home screen, it will show up under my available conferences. It makes it so easy for you as an owner to join by simply clicking on the join button here. I have set up then that the system will automatically call my phone and join me into the conference. I click join, my phone starts ringing. The AWV system is actually calling me at my extension. I answer the call. Welcome to the conference center. To join the call, press 1. The system knows it's me, the conference owner, so all I need to do is press 1. I don't need to enter in additional user credentials. At the tone, say your name and then press pound. Jessica. You're the first person in this conference. Please stay on the line. Now joining. Jessica. To turn off the music, press 1. Again, if I'm the first person activating the conference, it'll always give the option to play the on hold music or you can press 1 to just mute it until additional participants were joining. I would hear that roll call because that's how I set up my conferences as the owner to be able to hear who's joining. And then from my screen here, because this is an audio only conference, I'm going to be utilizing the participants tab. Again, the system brings me right here once I've joined as the leader, and it gives me all of the information of who's on my conference call. It lets me know their name and or phone number, so if it's internal, I would see that additional name information. 
It also gives me some nice features here to be able to mute or place that call on hold, as well as I could actually drop that caller off. Above here, I have all of the same options, but this is for everybody on the call. So you can see an unmute or drop all as well. I have the active speaker checkbox checked. What's nice about that is, again, visually, I would be able to see a list of all of my participants, and then the highlighted red one would be the active speaker on the call. This is sometimes helpful if someone perhaps forgot to mute their phone. You could see that background noise and then be able to mute for them or ask that person to mute their phone. I can also manually add a participant right from here as well, either by extension or outside number, as well as associate a name. And by pressing call, the system will do exactly what you just saw here. The system will call out to that phone number that I placed in here. That user will answer and it'll ask them to join the conference. Next, we will be discussing how to launch an audio and web conference and what that web client looks like for the owner. When I have an audio and web conference available for me to join, I can join it from my home tab by just clicking on join. Or again, if I click on the conference name here, it brings me to the conference details where I can click on the leader link to join my conference. By clicking on the leader link, it will open up my additional screen here to ask me how I would like to join this conference via the web or via the Windows client. The Windows client does actually download the client to your PC, but it gives you full collaboration capabilities. So as the leader or a participant, you could join this way. Or if you just want to join the session via your browser to just be able to view and listen to the conference, that's how you would join. So I'm going to click join here for the Windows client. It's going to be launching my client for me and bring me into the web client. Anytime I have a participant that's already joined before I joined, you'll see their information here under my participants bar as well. So, a few different key sections of your web client. The left hand side, you'll have all of your participants with their information and how they've joined. So, if they joined via the audio or collaboration, it'll give you that information here. As well as I have my meeting center tab down the center of my screen that gives me all of the important shortcuts that I would use during this call. Let's go over some of those. We have the share tab right on top. What's great about an audio and web collaboration session is me as a leader or any participant that I give the rights to can share documents. By clicking on share, it allows me to choose whether I want to share a desktop application, my whole screen, or just a region of my screen. Just a few key reminders about the different ways to share. If I choose my full desktop, my participants would see any email pop-ups or call pop-ups that I may be getting on my PC as well. So sometimes I just like to share the desktop application such as a PDF file or a Word document because any other pop-ups that would be happening on my screen, they wouldn't see. The next option here you have is video broadcasting. So if I have video built into my PC or an external video device and I want to broadcast that video, I could simply click on video here. I would see all video callers in another window on my screen. Audio. You can have the option to participate via the audio right on your computer instead of having to call in from a phone. And you can do that by clicking this button here. Documents. What's nice as the owner of a conference, I can preload documents that are readily available when my participants join. So by clicking on the Documents tab as a participant, I could let them access the documents that I've loaded. Me as the leader brings me to this screen here to be able to select a file from my computer to load up to the conference. If there's any uploaded documents, you'll see that I have the hyperlink here to click, and it would bring me to another window with a list of associated documents. Or if there's none, you can see here that there isn't. So I can just close those windows. Exit the meeting. Again, what's nice about being the leader is you have these two options. One says exit and one says end. If my portion of the call is done, but maybe I have two other coworkers that need to discuss an additional item, I can just simply exit the meeting, but it still leaves my conference bridge open for them to be able to talk on and or share documents if needed. If I, as the leader, choose end meeting, that means that I'm ending the call and any remaining participant would get dropped off. So as the leader, you have these options. 
As a participant, you just have the option to exit the meeting on your own. I'll always have these meeting details over here in my meeting center as well, just reminding me of the call-in information as well as the access codes for participant or leader. Let's talk about some of the main menus across the top. So what's nice about the meeting center, it gives me those quick access buttons to press right away about the most important features that we usually use, but we have all of these options across the top in menu dropdowns as well. So simply by selecting, you'll get your meeting center information here. We have the option to share, just as I showed you before with the three different types of sharing. Video, if we want to broadcast our video boxes. Audio as well, which way we want it to join. As well as a leader, here's an additional option that we have. You have the ability to record your conference. I showed you a little earlier how to do audio recordings only or where you can find those to access them. But from an audio and web conference, I'd want to launch my recorder here and I can stop, start recording. I can open a recording, a play recording. Under preferences as well, you get some additional options. The view button here, this is where you can personalize some of your settings as an end user or a leader of your conference. By the checkboxes, it allows you to know which windows by default you always want to see when you launch your conference. So you can see that participants is checked. That's a pretty important window that we always want to see. The chat, you can see here that we have an all public chat that's checked right over here. That gives me a chat tab right from my meeting center. So anyone that would be on my call, we would be able to have a full group running chat right on this tab right here. Another one, again, is video. So let's say we were going to have a video call. By me selecting video here, it brings me a whole new pop-up region of my computer screen, and this is where all of the different individuals' video feeds would appear for me to be viewing during my conference call. Now let's stop here for a second. So you saw me add another region to my screen. What's really nice is you can also customize this window layout. Simply by selecting a particular window, I can drag and drop this to another monitor if I had one or to a different area of my screen. What I do a lot as a conference leader is the participants and who's actively talking is pretty important for me to always monitor. So I usually will drag this to another monitor off to the side and then I can use my main monitor to be sharing documents if I need it. Now you can see here my screen looks a little jumbled. What's nice is I can go back to that view tab and I can restore to a default layout. Watch what that does. It brings me right back to how I originally logged into the conference. So that's a nice feature to use. Then finally, the last menu option we have here is the help file. Believe it or not, it's pretty helpful. So you can access this help file here. It'll launch another browser window with an online help index file where you can search contents, main topics that we talked about. You can also print from here. Um, so definitely come here for any additional information that maybe you just need to brush up on or to learn a little bit more about to go with along with this training video. All right, so one final thing that I'm going to show you here on our web conference bridge is in the participants tab. Now, I only have a couple people in this conference, but I do want to show you simply by right clicking on a participant, it's going to open up a box of a variety of different options that I can have between myself as the conference leader and that participant. I could give control of my computer to this person. So if I'm doing a co-meeting maybe with another coworker and they need to take control or explain a document, they would have mouse access to my computer. I could also request control to a participant. We use this feature a lot for troubleshooting. If I need to take control of somebody's computer, I can access their computer. It would give them a pop-up on their end saying that I'm requesting control and they can accept or deny. Any of the um, options that are grayed out just means that they're not available for how that person joined your conference, but you can put them on hold if they were on audio, mute, drop, so on and so forth. I could start a private chat with a person by right clicking. So if we didn't want to go in the public chat where everybody would see it, you can chat privately with a participant. And I can also remove somebody right from this meeting as well. So those are a few additional options that are really helpful that you can play along with in that participants tab when you're running your meetings. That's all I have today. Actually, there's one more thing. I want to focus on this recorder because as I showed you before the window layout, it just came to me. I like to have my recorder as an option 
So what I like to do is I'll hit start recording. It automatically brings up the record bar here for me to start a recording. So when I do that, I can play, I can pause, and I can tell my computer where I want to save that recording to. This is great for update calls and meetings as well that you want to access after they've been completed. That's all I have for you guys. Thanks so much for joining my training video and we'll see you next time.